Majora's Mask, Chapter 46, New Wave Bossa Nova. Link didn't stop until he reached Zora Hall. He climbed onto the domain's damp cave floor, panting as he crawled to safety. Link leaned against the closet wall, struggling to catch his breath. He closed his eyes. You're safe, he told himself. You escaped. Mikau? Link looked up to see Azora watching him. Her long fishtail was a heavy weight on her head. Are you okay? Yeah, Link said. I I'm fine. He stood, realizing that he did not look fine at all. I hope Tattle finds her way in, the boy thought. She could still be in danger if Dark Link could fly now. I, I just need to see. He reached for the band leader's name. <laughs> e Evan. Link stumbled past the Zora, but she stopped him before he could get away. What's on your chest? She asked. Link froze. He looked down to see that the black mark had crept further across his Zora body. The small dot was now a bold, dark line. Oh, yeah, uh, a scratch. He lied, walking into the domain's central chamber. The large shell-like stage was still pristine, and the waterfall behind it continued soothing Zora Hall. Link's panic didn't subside, however, until he saw his fairy flying toward him. Tattle! Link! She said, returning to his side. She stopped when she realized her mistake, turning to see the Zoras watching them suspiciously. Link! Link! Ding! Your face! To, uh, guitar? Hey, Mikau! Um, could we talk somewhere private? Link nodded, hoping no one else had read too much into her slip. He opened the door to Mikau's room, and thankfully, his roommate, Tijo, was not there. Link sat in a chair on Tijo's section since the ladder leading to Mikau's remained broken. It found us, Tuttle said. How did it find us? I think I know, Link said. Did you see his eyes? Tuttle's expression was grim. It's like when you... She trailed off, realizing she didn't know what to call it. Like when the dark magic takes over you, except Dark Link is somehow controlling it. Link nodded. Whenever it happens, I immediately see things from the school kid's eyes. But when we were on the beach before the moon fell, when I saved you, for the first time, it wasn't just the imp's eyes. I also saw through the mask, through Majora. Now the Dark Link is connected to that mental mess. What if he can see through all of us? Majora, the Skull Kid, or me. As long as he has that dark magic inside of him. The dark magic and the ocarina's magic. I think we've lost. Dark Link will always know where we are. Tattle furrowed her brow. But the Skull Kid and Majora can't? No. Link said with certainty. Because the light magic hurts them. It doesn't hurt Dark Link. So the Shadow knows we're in Zora's domain? Yes, but I guess he can't swim, or else he'd already be here. Tattle gulped. What if he's waiting for us on the shore, right when we get back? Fear flashed across Link's face. He very well could be, the boy thought. I don't know, he said, but we don't have a choice, do we? But if he's there, he'll turn his eyes purple and kill us! And even if his power has to recharge or whatever, he still has his bow and sword. He never stops and we can't kill him! You shot a hook right through his face and he got back up! But there's one thing we haven't tried against him, Link said. The same thing that stopped the Skull Kid from killing us every time. You mean you're a scar? Tattle said. Link... We don't know how to turn it on without you being upset or attacked first. And even when it does happen, you're not in your own head. You'll be inside the Skull Kids and have no control over your actions. 
Self-defense seems to be the goal of whatever is controlling me, though. Link said. Yeah, and setting forest fires that almost kill you anyway, remember? I know you've never seen yourself in that state before, but- I have, Link said. Whenever it happens in front of the Skull Kid, I've seen myself. Then you understand how terrifying it is? I understand. It's the only thing powerful enough to scare Majora. But at what cost? Tattle said. It's a huge gamble every time it happens. Everyone around you is in danger, not just the Skull Kid. What else can we do? Link asked, standing. Tattle didn't respond. Exactly. For all we know, maybe Dark Link left. Maybe it's not on the shore waiting for us. That's just being willfully ignorant, the fairy said. Link sighed, shaking his head. I guess it doesn't matter right now. We still have our Great Bay mission, which hopefully won't involve fighting Dark Link or the Skull Kid, so we don't have to decide right now. I'll talk to Evan, and then we'll look for the other eggs. He paused. If we run into Dark Link, we'll try to fight him. Maybe he'll shoot lightning at me or fire, and then my little evil deity thing will kick in, and maybe we'll stand a chance. If that happens, you just need to fly away as far as possible and hope for the best. Tattle considered. She eventually nodded. Deity thing? She said, finally relenting and switching back to sarcasm. Don't think too highly of yourself, Deku Head. You're not a god. Link smiled. I thought you didn't believe in gods. Tattle laughed. Right, but I do believe in what I see, and I suppose the power you have, the Skull Kid, Majora, and Dark Link too, is as close to godlike as anyone can be. Link nodded. A battle amongst gods in a realm of shadows. Sounds like a poem. A depressing poem, Tattle said. I hope we get a change of author soon, or else I don't think we're lasting much longer. Link, still disguised as Mikao, eventually entered Evan's room while Tattle waited outside. He found the band leader absentmindedly playing his piano like he had earlier. Azora looked up to see his guitarist. Mikao, he said, standing from the piano to greet him. Did you do it? You look tired. I, I did, Link said, panicking when he realized the eggs were hidden in his human form. I, I, I found four, but the other three weren't there. Evan frowned. Do you know where they are? I'm not sure. I overheard the pirates say they lost the other three, but they didn't say where. They said something about getting them before the sea snakes did. Pinnacle Rock, Evan said immediately. They were talking about Pinnacle Rock. That's where the sea snakes live. It's just across the pirate's cove where the fortress is, further out into the sea. So the eggs are there? If what you overheard is true, Evan said. And if the sea snakes haven't eaten them already. I'll go out there as soon as I can, Link said, turning to leave. Thanks for the help. Just be careful, the band leader said. The sea snakes are pretty dangerous, and the murky water makes it almost impossible to navigate. You'll have to find a creative way through. Link nodded. I will. Oh, and one more thing. Where are the eggs you did find? Link spat out the first answer that came to him. In my room. Heaven seemed horrified. You have to get them to the researcher immediately, in the laboratory with the hook on top. The eggs won't live much longer. Uh, right. Got it. Link said. So much for resting, the boy thought. When he left the room, Tattle was waiting for him with a skeptical look. How'd your super secret talk go? M minor complication, Link said, which caused Tattle's skepticism to grow. Remember how you worried you might die if you disappeared with the rest of my items when I put on a mask? Yeah, why? Mm, I didn't think about the fact that I was doing the same thing with the eggs. Tattle's eyes widened. I'm sure it'll be fine, Link said. Let's go check. They rushed to Mikau's room. After ensuring no one was in there, Link removed the mask and took out one of the bottles. The egg inside still seemed to pulse with a developing heartbeat. Tattle sighed with relief. You are one lucky son of Azora. A veil winced as her companion pressed a washcloth over her wound. She wanted to scream, but she wouldn't. Ugh! Do you have to do this right now? 
she said with bile. We have to clean it so it heals, her assistant reassured her. She was still adorned in her white outfit, taking a bottle that held a strange blue liquid. A veil lay on a table in a small room, and a lantern dangled from the wall to illuminate the medical station. The pirate in white removed the bloody washcloth from a veil's sword gash on her side, pouring the blue solution over it. A veil clenched her teeth again. <sighs> I'm going to kill him! The image of the shapeshifter in the green tunic was still vivid in her mind. He'd somehow taken on the form of a Zora, a Goron, and a human, and the eerie similarities between the boy and the shadow made her think there was more wickedness up his sleeve. <clears throat> that boy, he's the one who killed some of our guards. <clears throat> the arrows in their necks, they were different from the demons. <clears throat> The caretaker only appeared half-interested. She kept applying pressure and medicine to the deep sword wound. She reached for bandages tearing free enough to cover it. Both of them deserve to be punished, the assistant said in monotone. They're working together, Havail said. I just know it! Sweat beaded down her forehead as she fought off the pain. All she could think about was them, the shape-shifting thief and his demon. They were both relentless murderers. The boy had only spared her because he knew humiliation was a far worse fate for the pirate's leader. They are wicked, ruthless, and wield forbidden magic. It's our duty to stop them. They are both abominations, the caretaker said emotionlessly. <laughs> yes, Havail said. Yes. He is. No one challenges us and gets away with it, especially one twisted by the dark hearts. She smiled when she saw her bow and scimitars lying on the floor. They were always by her side. We leave for the temple tomorrow. That has to be why he wants the eggs. We'll beat him there, and he'll pay. Link was grateful to leave the laboratory. The professor would have droned on for hours about the Zora eggs if they hadn't insisted on leaving. He closed the door to the great hooked metal shell with Tattle at his side. They stepped onto the pier's second-story wooden platform. The original beach where Epona remained was only several feet away. He seemed much more excited to see Zora, you. Tattle said, smirking. Yeah, Link said, glad he decided to visit the researcher as Mikau. I'm just happy those four eggs are safe, and I can finally ditch some of those bottles. Three is much more manageable. He paused, looking off in the direction where he knew Pirate's Cove lay. Hopefully we're not too late getting the last of them. The two stood on the platforms for a moment longer, cautiously examining the shore. The same threat was on both of their minds. Dark Link. But they'd seen no signs of the shadow since leaving Zora Hall. Hopefully he just left, the boy thought. Though he'd be surprised, Link had done nothing but flee. He hadn't posed a significant threat to the monster. Maybe we did get lucky this time, Tattle said when there were still no signs of their assassin. Yeah, maybe, but I don't understand it, unless the Skull Kid called him back for some reason. Well, something tells me we haven't seen the last of him, Tattle said. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it, assuming he doesn't burn the next one too. Link nodded, diving into the water and swimming toward the cove. His ferry followed from above. When the iron gate was in view, Link broke the water surface and bobbed in place. He turned from the fortress to look further into the ocean. Two tall, pinnacle-shaped rocks towered on the horizon. They stood several feet apart and likely ran further underwater than above. Nothing else surrounded them. They were simply two unassuming, lone pillars in the bay. That looks like the place. Link said, as Tattle caught up with him. I would be in agreement. Meet you there? Link agreed. He went underwater again, wriggling his body like an eel to fluidly resist the current. It still felt incredible to swim as a Zora. Swimming honestly doesn't capture it, he thought. It was a way of existing he'd never known, in the water as Mikau. He was home. Though his appreciation ended when he saw blood. It floated in murky clouds, accompanied by strands of dead matter. Link stopped swimming, following the blood trail in the monster's remains. He found the culprit. Mines. 
One or two floated in place, as spiky, small, and silver as the one he'd almost run into in the fortress. They were tethered to the bay floor by chains, but floated high enough to trap unsuspecting seafarers. This means the pirates have been out here, Link realized. The eggs can't be far. Link continued swimming, cautiously now. As he neared the two columns, he saw another Zora swimming between the pillars of rock. The columns seemed to serve as an entryway. Once he passed through them himself, Link saw another feature in the distance. Underwater, however, it was impossible to make out. The Great Bay is still cursed, he recalled, and its murkiness was profound from beneath the waves. He broke the water's surface, hoping to get a better viewpoint from above. Far past the two columns, six rocky peaks formed a ring. This, clearly, was Pinnacle Rock, while the two lone ones were an initial doorway. Though he could make out the distant shapes, the underwater murkiness persisted above the waves too. He squinted through the mysterious fog, understanding how so many people got lost. Tattle somehow managed to find him. This fog is crazy, the fairy said. Is it as bad underwater? Yes, Link said, pointing to Pinnacle Rock. So I'm not sure how we're going to make it out there. The other Zora Link had seen broke the water with him, swimming to join the two. Mikal, haven't you seen any gold-colored fish around here? The female Zora asked. N no, Link said uncertainly. He wondered if he was a mild acquaintance with this person or if this was another close friend of Mikal's. The gold ones know this area very well, the Zora said. I was thinking of getting one to guide me to Pinnacle Rock, so I wanted to check if you'd seen them. Gold-colored fish, Tattle said. Like a golden Zora? The Zora ignored her comment, turning back to the famous guitarist. If you're looking to make it there too, you should ask them for help. They don't appear bothered by the murky water. Only trouble is, I haven't seen one in a while. I've been trying to get through. I hear the pirates may have lost something special there, but it's too hard to see and know where I'm going without help. The memory of the fisherman's fascinating golden creature returned to Link's memory. Thank you, Link said. You have no idea how much you just helped me. So, Epona's doing okay? Link asked. He was a human again, and he looked around the small fisherman's hut. It hadn't changed since earlier this morning, which felt like a lifetime ago already. He considered the best strategy on asking for the golden fish. I can't come off too desperate. The hero thought. The fisherman didn't seem to be the generous type. The long, golden fish with a snout bobbed in its tank, staring at the visitors. It blinked as if aware of them, waiting to see what they would do. Yeah, yeah? The large fisherman said, slightly irritated. She's okay. Why wouldn't she be? Tattle stared at him with daggers for eyes. Clearly, she hadn't forgiven him for abandoning Mikal. I haven't either. Link thought, but we need him for a little bit longer. Help me. Link instantly turned to the fish tank. The creature still stared directly at him, and it had spoken. Please. The fish continued in a small, high-pitched voice. Take me back to the waters near Pitocle Rock. Link's eyes widened, taking a step closer. It sounded like a small child. He hadn't heard a fish speak before. Link? Tattle asked. The hero blinked away the fish's captivating pull. He turned to see the fairy and fisherman watching with confused expressions. Are you interested in that fish? The fisherman asked. Yes, actually, Link said. Can it talk? The fisherman laughed. <laughs> of course, but a little hard to hear sometimes. He's only heard by those he wants to be heard by. Rare fish indeed. Yeah, Link said, admiring his golden aura again. I've never seen a fish like that before. It's called a seahorse, the fisherman said. I caught it swimming around here, just off Pinnacle Rock. Since it's rare, I was thinking of selling it at the town carnival. If you want it, I'll give it to you. Really? Link asked, surprised by his offer. On one condition. Link sighed mentally. 
Of course. Tattle sigh naturally was less discreet. Do you have a pictograph of the female pirates? The fisherman asked. Fury immediately overwhelmed Tattle's face. Her lips quivered with some retort as she abruptly flew out of the hut before she lost control. The fisherman hardly noticed her departure. Link wasn't sure what to say. He turned to the blurry picture of the pirate already hanging on his wall. Uh, no. I don't even have a pictograph box. The fisherman sighed. Mine's all blurry. Any good picture of a pirate would do. Even a snapshot of a guard. Can you help me out? Link shifted uncomfortably. You want me to bring you a picture of a pirate so you can hang it on your wall and... He trailed off not wanting to finish that statement. Do we have a deal? Link wasn't sure what to say, but he eventually shook his head. Mm, no, but thanks for watching my horse. He then left the hut and found Tattle fuming outside. She immediately flew up to Link. And the audacity! I know. Asking a child to... to... Tattle screamed in fury. It's just truly unbelievable! I joined the pirates in their thieving and murdering if I lived in this bay of perverts too! Well, let's forget about trying to play nice then, Link said. I have a better plan to get that fish. Tattle raised an eyebrow. Seriously? She flew closer. The hero of time is ready to play dirty, finally? Link nodded. For an awful man like that, absolutely. He removed the Zora mask from his bag, set his hookshot aside, and transformed. When he returned to the fisherman's hut, he did so as Mikau, armed. The fisherman had already sat at his table, a piece of bread in hand. He paused mid-chew to see the Zora standing in his doorway. Yes? He said. Link said nothing. He stood there, staring with menacing eyes into the home. The fisherman stood uncertainly, swallowing nervously. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You, you're that Zora that died. The one from that band. Link brandished the small metal contraption in his hand in response. Are you a ghost? What do you want? My friend, Link said, pointing at the golden fish. The fisherman followed his fingers. No, he said, suddenly mad again. No, get out of my house, you animal. You don't command me. I'm a... He was cut short. Link leveled the hookshot and the pointed tip sprang forward, zipping right past the fisherman's head and piercing the blurry picture of the Gerudo pirate. The fisherman jumped in shock, shaking from head to toe as he backed away from the strange weapon. No! Ah! He exclaimed. Just take it! Take it and get out! You, you evil ghost! <laughs> Leave me alone! Link walked up to the tank, scooped the golden fish out, and left the hut behind. Soon, Link stood on the rocky ledge surrounding Pirate's Cove. He remained in Mikau's form with a bottled seahorse in one hand. His hookshot had been returned to his hidden bag, and Tattle remained by his side. He could only stand there and stare at the water at first. It's been a long day, he thought. He'd healed another broken soul, raided a fortress, threatened, killed, and spent his time in between impersonating a celebrity, his optimism for their Great Bay adventure had clearly been misplaced. You feeling extra reflective today, Link? Tattle asked. He blinked, looking up from the water as he abandoned his thoughts. I'm just not used to doing the things I've done in Great Bay. Scaring, intimidating, and murdering people. Tattle took a moment to reply. Yeah... But the fishermen and the pirates didn't exactly leave us with other options, and they aren't good people either. I know. Link took a deep breath. Like I said in the fortress, I've had to do these things before. I just hope these parts of my life were over. The fairly merely looked back at him with a thoughtful expression. I know she probably wants to congratulate me, he thought. She'd been pushing him to be more ruthless for a while now. But... I appreciate her restraining herself. Link stepped up closer to the edge. Ready? He said. 
I'll be waiting for you topside once you have the eggs, Deku Head. Link dove into the water, relishing its cool, inviting feel. He kept the bottled seahorse in one hand as he pulled himself toward the twin-columned entrance, weary of the floating mines. The seahorse kept staring at him from within his glass prison while they sank to the sandy floor. Once Link's feet touched the bottom, he set the fish free. Instead of fleeing, the seahorse spun back to face his rescuer, stretching his fins and tail. His snout curled into what might have been a smile. His mysterious demeanor immediately became positive. Finally! He squeaked. The fish's voice was as clear and high-pitched as earlier. Link smiled. I'm glad I could help. The hero looked ahead to the murky seawater. Pinnacle Rock seemed impossibly far away and obscured. You have strange powers, Link, the seahorse said. The hero balked. Link? He wasn't sure how the fish could know his name, especially since he was hidden in Mikau's body. If I may be so bold, I have another request for you, the seahorse said, ignoring the hero's shock. Please, follow me. Before Link could agree, the strange fish darted for Pinnacle Rock. Link floated off the ocean floor and did his best to keep up. Wait! The seahorse kept barreling ahead regardless. Zora tried his best to keep up, barely dodging the remaining mines. Since only the seahorse could see through the murkiness, Link barely saw the explosives in time. Only the gangly golden fish glowed in the water to guide him in Great Bay's cloudy depths. The seahorse's path made no sense. It went all over the place. Everywhere except Pinnacle Rock, it seemed. But Link kept faith, and after a small eternity, he reached the end of Great Bay's murkiness and Pinnacle Rock's beginning. The six mountainous towers were now right in front of him. They still made a circle, but now the hero could see what was between them, an abyss. The massive hole was wide, deep, and dark, descending to an unknown destination. Link slowly landed at its edge, approaching it with fear. He peered over the edge, hardly believing its eyes. The deep sea chasm was wider than any building Link had seen above land. The seahorse stopped at the ledge, too, appearing unbothered by its terrifying depths. Here in the depths of Pinnacle Rock live many dangerous sea snakes, and my friend is trapped there. Link watched his new friend's expression fall again. I can look for your friend, Zora said, and help them by getting rid of the snakes. The fish was adorable, as was his voice. Link was happy to help him. Thank you, the seahorse said. I'm sure you can do it. Link looked into the dark abyss again. Eggs, sea snakes, and a captive friend, he thought. That's all? He closed his eyes, already missing Tattle's company on this mini-adventure. Hopefully this is the last thing we need to do before the temple. Link stepped off the cool rock ledge. He allowed himself to float down, bracing himself as the warmth and light faded. The golden seahorse waited from the top, watching him descend. Pinnacle Rock's enormous walls seemed to grow around him as he went further down, its immense perimeter eventually blotting out all sunlight. Even in the abyss, Link saw the occasional untethered mine float by. Sea snakes wouldn't be the only danger. Here, his bright Zora body was a beacon and an obvious target. Soon, Link passed a hole in the chasm wall. He stopped his slow floating, wading over to the circular edge. In the cave's darkness, however, a pair of green eyes opened. Link froze as those eyes rocketed toward him with alarming speed. The beast was upon him before he saw what it was. A pointed, wet mouth closed over his torso. Link tried to wriggle free, but the creature swung the hero around like discarded trash. When the lips released him, Link spiraled through the water, regaining his balance to observe the creature. A long, slender body was shrouded in darkness, tethered to the cave's innards and wielding those emerald eyes. A sea snake! Link realized. It had left a few bite marks on his chest and stomach. Link hoped the creature wasn't venomous. The snake never left its home completely, hissing in his direction as if the Zora would return. Instead, Link leveled his arms and released his sharp boomerang fins. They cut through the water like thin air, slicing through the sea snake from both sides. The creature let out a wail of defeat as it drifted from its home. Dead. As Link waited for his spinning fins to return, Another snake grabbed him from behind. This one was far more vicious, savagely flinging him around and allowing its teeth to dig in further. Link tried to break free, but his returning fins saved the day. Where his forearms had once been, the snake's exposed neck now was. 
They sliced through, killing that one as well. The snake's mouth slackened, and Link swam free as his fins returned. Rather than floating again, Link swam into the darkness faster. I need to find those eggs, he thought. He did spot another mine and made sure to keep his distance, though straying from the center was dangerous as many sea snake holes likely filled the pit's walls. When another one shot out, Link was ready. He dodged it, narrowly avoiding the nearby mine too. A fourth one grabbed him from behind though, leaving him vulnerable to the other snake's attack. The two creatures wrestled for either half of him, pulling his body in two directions. Link grimaced, unable to move as they swung him dangerously close to the mine. When he realized his skin was starting to tear, Link stopped trying to squirm free. Instead, he jostled one of his captors into the nearby explosive. The boom was immediate. The snake who'd made contact was obliterated, and the blast sent Link hurtling away too. His body ripped free from the other sea snake, and he slammed hard against Pinnacle Rock's perimeter. His entire body ached as his head rang. The world spun as Link drifted limply down the rest of Pinnacle Rock's length. Through his blurred vision, he saw the surviving sea snake writhing in agony. It wouldn't last long. Link soon hit the bottom of the pit, now submerged in complete darkness. He raised his head slowly, turning to see something small and green beside him. A Zora egg! Link shifted even more in the sand, noticing two more eggs buried in the seabed as his vision cleared. Link floated off the ground, gathering himself as immense pain replaced the dizziness. However, a pair of green eyes opened between himself and the eggs. No! Link exclaimed. He used his remaining strength to push himself through the water. The snake left its cave on the floor, mouth wide open as it lunged for the eggs. In the mere seconds remaining, all Link would do was jump between the monster and its prey. Its wide mouth closed around the Zora. The sea snake realized its mistake immediately, choking on the man that didn't fit all the way in its mouth. Quite quickly, Link freed himself with his sharp fins and the snake fell away in pieces, dead like its brethren. Zora shook himself free of monster innards, taking note of his bruises and scrapes. Alongside the black mark coming through his chest, Bikau's form was looking more ragged than his Deku scrub and Goron forms combined. Link panted as he landed on the bottom again, walking over to the eggs and scooping them in his arms. Just as he finished, he saw something small and golden fly out of the last sea snake's cave. The seahorse didn't pay him any attention, swimming for Pinnacle Rock's top, which was a distant spotlight from its bottom. Link followed, struggling to keep up with all the eggs in his arms. The light above grew larger and larger. Eventually, Link returned to the rock ledge, battered and half-falling to safety. The two seahorses were already reunited, nuzzling their heads together lovingly. Thank you, Link, the original seahorse said, once again smiling. I offer you my deepest gratitude. Link nodded, finding the willpower to smile. The seahorses returned to each other, overwhelmed with joy as they swam together into the horizon. Link found their happiness contagious. Another happy ending, the hero thought. His harrowing journey into the abyss had been worth it. Though he thought of Zelda with a pang of sadness, and he wondered if anyone would ever dive into an endless pit to save him. Zora Link was out of breath as he approached the researcher's hooked laboratory. He held three Zora eggs in his arms, bearing the injuries of his harrowing swim through Pinnacle Rock's abyss. Tattle twinkled beside him. Are you sure you should be carrying those like that? What happened to the bottles again? Link barely managed to climb the ladder to the pier's higher section. Just have to deliver him, Link said, practically out of breath. He walked to the door, pausing to look at his fairy before opening it. You okay? She asked. Sea snakes are terrible. He left it at that. Tuttle nodded. I can see that. You look like a wolf who's chewed you up and spit you out. Again. For the ten thousandth time. Link smiled. I'll make sure to freshen up before tomorrow. I would hope so, Tattle said. You smell disgusting. He opened the door and walked inside. The professor looked up from his workbench to see the Zora and his fairy. Oh, he said, smiling. You finally came. I've been waiting. You have the eggs. Hurry. Put them in that aquarium. Link obliged, walking to the large fish tank that took up half the building. 
he noted the four Zora eggs already placed there, appearing healthier than the ones in his arms. Link climbed the ladder and walked to the top, placing each egg individually through the bar top scaps. The eggs gently sank to the bottom, joining their brethren in an anticlimactic reunion. All seven had finally been accounted for. Good, the professor said, walking with much more pep in his step. He appeared ten years younger all of a sudden. All of the eggs have been brought together. It's going to start. Quick, come to the front of the aquarium. Link climbed down the ladder, unable to find the willpower to protest or question him. I can't believe he hasn't even commented on my injuries, Link thought. The researcher has made his priorities extraordinarily clear. A battered adult Zora was of no concern to him. Here, take this, the professor said, drawing a chair for Link to sit in front of the tank. The hero practically collapsed into it, leaning back and sighing. Tattle joined him, eyeing the motionless eggs. So, what exactly is supposed to happen? Just wait and watch. The professor smiled widely, standing next to them as they watched the aquarium. Are they gonna grow legs and start dancing or something? Tattle asked. Maybe, the researcher said, as if on cue. The eggs began to tremble. The professor ecstatically pointed at them, giddy with excitement. One by one, the eggs' soft outer shells showed cracks. They kept shaking from the tank's sandy bottom, and soon, feeble limbs extended from the fissures. Each infant possessed only one leg, a tail extended from its body. They were shaded just like Zora's, but otherwise looked like tadpoles. Almost in coordination, they wriggled free from their eggs and drifted upward through the water. Strangely, the tadpole stopped at specific heights. Each one jittered excitedly whenever it ended its ascent, as if communicating something with its position. Their black eyes blinked in amazement as they took in the new world, wagging their tails with enthusiasm. Look! Look! Look at this! The professor said, jumping up and down. What does this mean? What in the world could this mean? Tattle narrowed her eyes at the baby Zoras. I don't know. You're the expert. I can't believe they actually started dancing. Each baby held its position vertically, forming an uneven line as they performed their unspoken coordinated routine. Oh, I got it, the professor said, raising his finger. The way these Zora children have lined up, it means... He trailed off, placing a hand on his chin. Means what? Tattle exclaimed. Don't leave us hanging! Do either of you happen to have an instrument? The professor asked. Link turned to the tadpoles again and made a realization. With their tails, small round bodies, and precise positions, they'd formed musical notes. Their bodies and tails indicated particular pitches on a staff. Tattle groaned. Nope, this is too absurd. If you can hear me, gods, goddesses, whatever, please go back to the writing room and come back with something less contrived and more believable. The professor furrowed his brow. Does the fairy always speak in such profound philosophical riddles? Link smiled. I think that's giving her jokes a bit too much credence. Right, don't mind me. Tattle said, forever the voice of reason in a world evolving into chaos. Another thought occurred to Link as he stood there. My ocarina is in my human form, he realized, and if the universe was telling him to do something very specific with that instrument, he had to make a choice. The Zora hero looked up to Tattle. What do you think? He asked. Tattle understood his question immediately. That's up to you, but personally, I'd say the stakes are relatively low. Oh, what are you two talking about? The professor asked with increasing interest. What does this have to do with a musical instrument? Link turned to him. How do you feel about magic, professor? He scoffed. It's not real. Everything has a scientific explanation, no matter how fantastical a phenomenon may appear. Link laughed, standing from his chair. <laughs> yeah, about that. He reached up to his face and removed the mask. He was a human once more, and instantly, all the fatigue from his injuries in Pinnacle Rock vanished. The professor gasped, backing into his equipment table, but the hero heedlessly pulled free his ocarina. He deciphered the baby's musical notes as the researcher struggled to process what he'd just witnessed. 
It only took a moment before Link closed his eyes and played a new song. Tattle listened closely, as did the professor. His shock slowly subsided into curiosity again. The Zora babies noticed the song too, and their dancing in place became even more vigorous. After the hero looped the short song multiple times, the fish disbanded. Rather than focusing all their intention on delivering the music, they now behaved like normal newborns, floating aimlessly in their home as they took in the new world. Link, Tattle, and the professor stood in silence for a moment. That, the professor said, was absolutely stupendous! Yes, it was all about that song! You're a little late on that revelation, bud, Tattle said. No, the old man said, turning to Link. If these Zoras were born to teach this song, then hurry! You must play this song for the Zora who laid these eggs! Link smiled again. We did it! he thought. We solved everything we needed to help Lulu. Thank you, he said. We couldn't have figured this out without you. Of course, the professor said, rubbing his hands together in glee. The Zoras are always of special interest to me, as are you. You should come back later and tell me more about yourself. It's not every day I meet an entity who can transform between a Zora and a human. You've entered my home as two different people. And until now, I had no reason to believe you were the same person. We'll see, Link said. I imagine our business in Great Bay will take a couple more days. But if there's time, very well, the researcher said. I trust that what you're up to is important. Just know there's an old man living on the beach who would give everything to study your incredible abilities. I understand your question about magic now, but I hold firm. Magic is a cheater's word. You'll find everything can be explained, one way or another. Thank you, Tattle said, flying up to him excitedly. Someone else who shares my affinity for truth and knowledge. The professor's smile only grew. We should talk sometime, then. Have you ever heard of the mini-toy theory? The what? Tattle asked, her excitement fading as quickly as it come. I think that everything in the universe can be reduced to single, minuscule units that cannot be divided any further. The basic building blocks for all matter in the universe. I call these particles mini-toids. Tattle's frown was now firmly in place. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna go now. She went to leave with Link, but the professor stopped them. Oh, I also think I have a name for that song of yours. The New Wave Bossa Nova. Yeah, thanks again, Tattle said, rolling her eyes as they returned outside. Link closed the door behind them, once again presented with the beach's gentle tide. You know, Link said pensively, it takes quite a bit to impress you. You hate pretty much everybody we meet. Well, it's not my fault that everyone in the world is an idiot, Tattle said smirking, except for me and you. Link smiled as he retrieved the Zora mask. Should we go play the song for Lulu, and hope that takes us one step further to the temple? Yes, but remember your ocarina. If you turn it to Mikau, it'll be hidden in your bag. Do you want to keep it out so you don't scare everyone? Link considered and shook his head. Mm, no, they know I'm a fake if I played that song on an ocarina. Maybe I'll look for Mikau's guitar and try to play it on that. Wait, you can play guitar too? Just how many instruments are you good at? I've actually never played guitar before, Link said. But it can't be that hard, right? The Skull Kid stood like a statue. He stared ahead with the orange eyes of Majora's Mask, its gaze heedlessly cut through the downpour of snow. The imp stood beside a massive cliff whose distant bottom was masked by the blizzard's relentless downpour. The white curtain was as thick as a waterfall. The sun had set long ago. It was late at night in Snowhead, and the second day's dawn was only hours away. In the cold darkness, only desolation thrived in the harsh tundra. A shadow approached from afar. On a precursory glance, one might expect more features to come into play as it drew nearer, but this being was a monster. Dark Link was midnight incarnate, bearing only red eyes. Its weapons were sheathed, and it trudged through the snow to close the space separating it from its master. The Skull Kid stared ahead intently, wooden and real eyes never wavering. 
The storm's bitter sound singed the air with its chilly, sharp voice. It stung. The shadow, however, didn't seem affected as its boots crunched the frozen water with each step. Eventually, they were face to face. The imp waited. Hatred was etched into every line of his hidden face. His fists were balled by his side. Do you realize you have failed me? The Skull Kid asked. Yes. The wind kept howling. And do you accept that you must be punished? Yes. Then you understand the severity of your crime, the Skull Kid said. You understand that you have made yourself useless. Stop. This was not the shadow. The mask spoke privately to him, giving its thoughts a voice only in the imp's mind. You have lost your place. End this foolishness immediately. I have made up my mind, the school kid said, ignoring Majora. There's no place for failure amongst my ranks. At first, only the winter storm broke the tense silence, until the shadow took a step forward, opening its mouth. Master. The imp lunged his hand into the servant's chest. The shadow's eyes widened with shock, mouth agape as its dark exterior was penetrated. You're too weak to be trusted with this power! The imp screamed. Stop! Major said, its voice laced with contempt. Immediately! But the Skull Kid did not relent, keeping his hand within the shadow Majora had created. This time, I'm taking all of it back! No one can be more powerful than me! He pulled against immense resistance as he extracted something from his servant's chest. It was something he'd seen before. A cloud of thick, purple tendrils. The shadow's eyes went from red to purple, and it began to scream. Or maybe it was Majora screaming. The dark voices rang in the imp's head as the Skull Kid forcefully extracted the fusion of dark and light magic. You foolish child, Majora said. The screaming, the howling storm, neither relented. The imp pulled his hand further out, struggling to remove all the magic. And then the burning started, just as it had with the boy. Except this time, the imp was ready for it. I will wipe you away from this world. The Skull Kid gritted his teeth as he overcame the pain to pull the curse free. But Majora and the Shadow were suffering as well. Their minds were connected as one while the pain reverberated through their shared mental space. No one defies Majora. It seared between them, a hot dagger driven into their stomachs. The burning steel fried their innards as the light tried to overpower the dark. The imp joined in the screaming as the pain became surreal. With one last mighty effort, the Skull Kid ripped his hand from the shadow's chest. The dark, cloudy substance came free. Immediately, the magic blew apart in the mighty blizzard, dissolving into oblivion. The shadow's eyes instantly became red, and its mind was no longer connected with theirs. Dark Link stumbled backward toward the cliff. It was still in shock as it tumbled over the edge. The servant reached out to grab something, but there was only air. The fog swallowed Dark Link whole. The Skull Kid collapsed, hardly noticing the shadow's demise. His hand went to his stomach, screaming as the pain still surged through him. <sighs> Vermin! Majora shrieked. You have destroyed my servant! You have destroyed our weapon! Stop! <gasps> the Skull Kid said. Majora's voice was too much to bear. They were both in pain. That mixture of light and dark magic was the demon's weakness, and they both suffered because of it. Majora was scared, scared that it could hurt so much that it had a weakness. You will obey. You will submit. You will let me control you. Submit or die. The Skull Kid sobbed, hysterical as his hands trembled and the malevolent voice continued. <laughs> Make it end, he thought. <laughs> Make it end. He remembered his vision of the purple fairy, Tail, his old friend, riding in the ashes, 
screaming for the suffering to end. I'm going to end up just like him, the Skull Kid thought. It's what Majora does to everyone. You insect, you are nothing. Please, the Skull Kid said, trembling. The imp tried to stand, but kept collapsing into the snow. Your friends left you. No one wants you. Jump off the cliff. Free the world of the burden that you are. No! The Skull Kid grabbed Majora's mask and flung it off his face. The demon spun through the air and disappeared behind Winter's Veil. The imp ran blindly into the storm, crying and shaking as the pain still racked his body. Majora's mask was left behind in the snow. <laughs>